Let's open up our Bibles to John 15. We are in the middle of our sermon series, Abide. Everybody say Abide. Thank you. We are going through it uh, systematically. Today we are going to look at a part of the passage that is very intense. I'll be getting to that in just a moment, but let us start with the passage itself, John 15. When you get there, say, I'm there. Okay, if not, look up at the screen. We're going to read it out loud. I'm going to read it out loud. And every time you see the word abide, what are you going to say? Abide. Thank you. Let's uh, start getting in on this right here. Verse 1, Jesus talking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, or another word for that is gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide. Thank you in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Thank you. Con continue on to verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, my words are uh, Abide in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so that you can show yourself to be my disciples. Verse 9, here are the last two verses, very important. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This has been the passage for all of November, and now it will be uh, for the rest of December, abiding in Christ. Ten times Jesus mentioned that term there, abide. What does it mean to rest, to remain, to stay? Stay with me. Jesus literally was saying, stay with me. Don't leave me. Don't turn away from me. Don't go in another direction. Come here. Rest from your journey of self-works, of, of, right, of self-righteousness and works-based religion, and stay with me. When we look to Jesus, Jesus is always asking us to come closer to him. Religion gives us the appearance that God is always moving away from man. But in Christianity, we always see that God is moving towards us. Jesus is coming by us. Literally in John 1.1, 1, 1, when it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, it goes on to verse 14, and it says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. It means that He literally came and pitched His tent next to ours. And says, I've been up there too long away from you. I'm now not going to speak through a burning bush. I'm not going to speak through an angel. I'm going to speak to you face to face. That should encourage every one of us here as we listen to this sermon today, especially, is that Jesus is not pushing us away. Jesus is not quick to trip us and laugh at us when we fall. He's not setting a standard that's impossible for us to do and then damning us when we don't. He is literally pitching his tent alongside of us, speaking to us face to face, or other words, heart to heart. And he is saying, rest with me. Come stay with me. Take a load off and hang out with me. Because today, my friends, this may be the last smile until the end of the message you'll see from me. So look at your neighbor and say, my pastor loves you. Look at your other neighbor and say, but he's going to get serious. The reason is, is because I have got to talk to you today about a part of this passage that many ignore, and that is a part of the passage we have been reading every week, and that is the part that says that he throws some branches into the fire. And I don't want my sense of humor to make you think I don't take this serious. I want the people who watch this video again or the ones you share it with because we record it not only live this direction, but this direction gets put on YouTube. And I want you to be able to send it to your friends. I want you to send it to your family. I want you to be able to say, this is what my church believes about hell. This is what I believe. I want you to listen to it. I want you to watch it. Because I think we have gotten so carried away in the church 
with talking about hell that we don't really believe it anymore. And so sadly, many today in the church, even among some disciples, don't even have a proper understanding of God's final judgment. Either God's judgment is ignored. Let's not talk about it. There are churches literally today, friends, that are packed to the gills because they don't want to talk about hell and judgment. Some people just want to ignore it. Others want to treat it as if it can't be that bad. It, it, it can't be that bad. You know, if God loves us, if Jesus died on the cross for us, it really can't be that bad. And many Christians even wish that somehow in the end, that hell and the lake of fire would just turn out not to be true. Just, hey, you know what? I'm a Christian. I read my Bible. I get it. But down deep inside, I, I just wish that part wasn't true. In other words, they're wishing down deep inside that hell would just vanish like a nightmare. Just go away. That somehow in the end everything works out. Somehow that person that I went and visited at the funeral home, their body, and I said they were in a better place, but I knew down deep inside they lived really bad. I, I hope that somehow God works that out and that I get to see them in heaven. Because it really can't be that bad. And I don't want to think about it. Let's talk about something else. However, when the church and Christians and disciples don't comprehend and teach the true nature of God's judgment, the world's only left with these cartoon images of a red-horned devil with a pitchfork roasting God's rejects. So that's real easy to laugh off and to, to play off and to, to make that look silly and go, yeah, that's dumb. I don't believe in that. Yeah, there's not a place called hell because that looks dumb. This image could not be further from the truth, though, friends. Hell is real. And it's because it's solely man's choice that sends him there that makes it all the more terrifying. You see, it's not a devil poking us and prodding us. It's a devil being cast there himself. It's a devil being assigned there himself. It's a place where he will be tortured too. And it's not a place where you want to sing about with your friends, I'm on the highway to hell. Because that place, no one knows your name. You're never comforted, and you never get another chance to change. We need to learn the truth today. And in the words of Charles Spurgeon, I must say this with you. If sinners be damned, if they do go to hell, at least let them leap over to hell over my dead body. Let my life be given for the gospel. And if they perish, if you today, friends, perish, let you perish with our arms, Metro Praise arms wrapped around your knees, imploring you to stay. And if hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our preaching and exhortations. And let no one, starting right now, go there unwarned or unprayed for. That's my heart in this message. Because when you go through this passage, this is one of the greatest passages Jesus gives us in all of the New Testament about us being close to him. You see this understanding of him being the vine, this life-giving source. And here we are as these green, luscious branches literally plugged into him. What the vine has, I have. Like electricity going through a plug, empowering its, uh, its item, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are given the love of the Holy Spirit. All that we need is given by God. That's who he's talking to, branches. Today's message and the message of abide is not to the weeds, to the un. Are uh, the unplanned sinfulness of the world that God said, it wasn't my fault, they chose that. He is speaking to branches. Look at the context. He doesn't say every weed. That's already obvious. Sinners are going to go to hell. But what he says here is every branch in me. Every branch in me. Look at the rest of the context. I am the vine, you are the branches. Who are the branches? You, my disciples. So who is he now warning about going to hell? He's warning disciples. 
They already knew these people were going to hell. They already knew that they once were going to hell, and now following Jesus, they're going to heaven. But now Jesus is warning them and saying, you guys, you who are branches in me. And I challenge you to read Ephesians and see how many times the phrase is used, in me, in Christ, in Jesus. This is strictly for Christians, strictly for believers. And he says, in me, branches in me that don't bear fruit, I cast away. Or my father, the gardener, casts away. See, the judgment of God can come to branches too. Not just weeds, not just sinners. God's judgment can come to you if you stop bearing fruit. So Christ is inviting you into a relationship with him. You say, yeah, I'll do that. And you get plugged into Jesus. You get connected into Jesus. You are abiding in Jesus. But if you start disconnecting, if you start turning away, if you start leaving and not staying, you will stop bearing fruit. And then he takes you away. And then you read on further what happens to the ones he takes away. In verse 6 of that passage, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. As a what? As a branch. Everybody say branch. What is this word here? As a what? Branch. This is speaking to people who are branches. Some have been taught here that once I become a Christian, I can never stop uh, not being a Christian. That is not true. He is saying you can be a branch in me and you can choose to stop abiding. And when you do, you will be cast out, taken away, and then you will begin to wither. The life that you once had will begin to be taken away from you. Now, this is the part that should bring terror to all of our hearts. And they gather them. What are they gathering here? The branches. The branches that just a few moments earlier were in the vine. These branches that once were lush, these branches that once were bearing fruit, now these branches he takes away and he casts them into the fire. I want you to get this image in your mind. This is not meant to scare you. I'm here to illustrate exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you know in agriculture, they burn junk all the time. They're burning weeds. They're burning their garbage. But every now and then, gardeners go to their vines and they trim off branches. And they'll take those branches and put them in that same fire. That same place where they put the dung. That same place where they put their garbage. That same place they put their weeds. That place will also have branches from their vineyard. My friends, if we do not take heed and do not take serious the warnings of God, we could find ourselves cast into this fire. You could find yourself cast into this fire. That's who he's talking about. He's talking to you and me. The sinner is already going to the fire. That's why we're telling them, you are going to perish. It is a sure fact that you are away from the Lord. John 3.16 clearly says it like this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But you have to continue on to John 3.17 and 18 because it says here, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him not is uh, whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son you see my friends it's obvious according to Jesus this is John 3 we're in John 15 it's already been clearly obvious you don't have Jesus you're going to hell it's already settled you're condemned you must get on the life raft of Jesus he is your only hope 
But now in John 15, Jesus is looking to disciples that are engrafted into his vine, that have already been made clean by his word, that are abiding in his love. He's saying intermingled into this beautiful passage. He is saying in the midst of this passage that if you stop bearing fruit, you will be cut off. Peter, the devil wants to sift you, but I'm praying you do not fall. That was true for Peter. Peter came this close to being cut off. Judas was cut off. What was the difference between Judas and Peter? One refused to stay. No matter what Peter had went through, he still came back. He was relentless not to give up. And when Jesus came after him, he said, I have nowhere else to go. I will stay. Judas took his own neck and hung it. What a spiritual example here of what it looks like when we do not abide with Christ. When you look at this illustration today, this should bring terror to our heart. Listen to me, my friends. Don't fear the devil. Fear the one who sends the devil here. Don't fear ISIS. Fear the one who sends ISIS here. That's what Jesus said. Don't fear the one who can kill the body only. Fear the one who can damn your soul forever. Fear God. Fear God. All of our fears, all of our insecurities, all of our worries should be submitted to the fear of God. Now some people think, you know, well, God's my father. God loves me. He could never judge me. And there's a true sense to that, that now in Christ I am free from the judgment of God. But that doesn't mean that God is still not a judge. He still will judge. And if I leave his house, I can find myself in his judgment. And this is the example I love to give. My son is in my house. He bears my name. All discipline and punishment now that I give him is for his good, never for his harm. But yet, if I was in the military and a leader, let's say I was a general, I was a a, a leader of a platoon, a group of men, if my son joined ISIS and became a terrorist and now wanted to bomb the base my men are on, I would destroy my son. My son has left my house. My son has become an enemy to the men I'm protecting. That is how a son becomes an enemy to a father. God is no different. You are a Christian. You are in God's house. God disciplines you. God corrects you. That was what we talked about last week, the pruning. It is for your good. He loves you. You're in his house. You side with the one who hell is destined for. You side with the great traitor of heaven. He took a third, the devil took a third of the angels with him in heaven. If he gets you to join his side, you now have become an enemy of God. Some of you today are not taking that serious enough. And I want to wake you up today. I'm not preaching a message about hell for your friends who are out partying last night. I'm preaching the message of hell to Christians as Jesus did. This is who Jesus wanted to be warned today as he spoke about this message of abiding. Listen to this warning that we see here. In the book of James, we begin to see that there is this kind of wisdom that can deceive you or cause issues among us. There's a wisdom of the world and there's a wisdom of God. There's a way the world does things and there's a way God does things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he's warning Christians James is the half brother of Jesus because Mary kept having children after her virgin birth with Joseph, legitimate children from Joseph and Mary. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, of the seed of the Holy Spirit. But Joseph and Mary also had children. James is one of those children, a half brother of Jesus, one who used to mock Jesus. Now he becomes a leader in the church. Listen to this. He says, if you start following the wrong wisdom, you start thinking like the world does, you start following Kate Jenner, you start listening to Oprah Winfrey, you start following young people, the rappers of this world or the movie stars, you start following the the, the people of this world. Look at what it says here. It says, you adulterous people, you cheaters. You see, you can't be an adulterer unless you're married. He's talking to people married to Christ, the bride of Christ. He says, hey, some of you are in the church. You're adulterers. You're cheating on God. You think it's okay. It's not okay. You're an adulterer. Don't you know that friendship with this world is at enmity against God? 
Therefore, anyone who chooses, everybody say choose. You better say it like you're up today. Say choose. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You choose to be an enemy of God. If I turn my back on God and find myself in this terrifying place, it will not be his fault but my own choice. It will be the choice of a wicked heart that said, I don't want to stay with Jesus. I want to be a friend of this world. I want what this world has. The Bible is so serious that it has a place called hell. Could you think of anything more serious? I'm just asking you today. I mean, how much, I mean, how much more serious could we be today? What else could I be talking about that would be more serious? What all the politicians are talking about, it's not even as serious as this. What's going on in companies today and your job, it's not as serious as this. In some of my engagement with the doctors and nurses and rude people at hospitals, I kind of just wanted to have them come sit on my knee and tell them, come here, Mr. Dr. Big Bucks, come here. You play around with pieces of metal and bone. I talk to men's soul. Listen to me. How you treat others is how you will be treated and judged by God. Just because you hold the cards now doesn't mean you win in the end. Donald Trump won't win in the end in a heart that's wicked. The people who oppress the poor will not win in the end. And I'm not trying to be political about who he is as a president. I'm talking about when you live greedy, when you oppress the poor, you will not win. Obama will not win. He has a wicked heart. He's already showed us this heart. Some of you are so concerned about Donald Trump. You have a genocidal president right now, friends, who approves of abortion. What more do you need to rebuke him? So if you rebuke Donald Trump for his oppression, and I'm with you, rebuke Obama for O'Green with the slaughter of unborn kids. Whose side are you on? What do you think God says about abortion, my friends? I don't care what this world says. I'm going to say it again. Get a picture of Caitlyn Jenner. Get a picture of Oprah Winfrey. You choose to be a friend of this world. You now are an enemy of God. I don't care what your friends say. You understand? I don't care what they tell you. They're lying to you. This world is lying to you. And look at the mess that we're in now, my friends. Look at the mess we're in. There is a place called hell that sets it right. And we're going to get to that because I don't want to just be angry today. I want you to take me serious though because to me, there is nothing more serious. Everybody gets found out in the end. Everybody. You will be found out in the end. You will be found out. What wickedness did you hide in your heart? What things did you approve of? For us here today, we cannot take this lightly. You can't look to me and say, Pastor, he hasn't warned me. You can't tell me that I preach to you just for your money and for what you would give in an offering. You can't accuse me of that, friend. On the day of judgment, when you stand before God, you won't accuse me of trying to tickle your ears, tell you funny jokes all the time, and be your buddy. I have told you about this because I love you. And I didn't want to crack jokes because I didn't want you to think this is funny. It's not funny. My sister died. You've heard the story, drinking and driving. If she didn't repent, that's where she is right now. Your friends, your family members, there are people there right now. Not every funeral you've been to, my friends, don't be deceived, is in a better place. They're all not in a better place. Some of them are in eternal torment. And don't you get angry at God, my friend, because he gave them the same choice he gave you. The same choice. There will be no one there by accident. There will be no one there that's going to put God on the witness stand like they're with Judge Judy and say, now let me say how I got a problem with God. No one will stand in his courtroom and argue with him. There is no one that can shake a finger at God and say, how dare you? How dare you? No, he sent Jesus to die for us. 
He's preached the gospel through his witnesses all throughout the world. You know it. You knew it before you came to this church. And you know if you would have died and went to hell, you would have had no excuse. Some of the things that we look at when we see the Bible are these two places. One is called hell. One is called the lake of fire. They're actually not the same thing, though they combined at one time in the end. I'll explain this to you. There's this place called hell that Jesus always refers to, and that is the temporary place where departed souls are being held now until the great white throne judgment. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, you can turn there with me, please. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, you see that there are some that are there now. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment... Some of the fallen angels are there now. There's a reason that some are let loose upon this earth to test mankind, but there are some that God was so disgusted with, he put them there now. Fallen angels are there now. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood of Noah on its ungodly people and Sodom and Gomorrah, there are people that are there now. Noah's generation has been there for 6,000 years almost. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah, what, 4,000 years? Suffering without end. In this place called hell, there's fire. There's torment. There's gnashing of teeth. There's worms that die not. Something afflicts the people. Not some red-horned little devil with a, with a pitchfork. Something that is in the place of their soul tormenting them and weeping. And then we see that there is this place called the lake of fire. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, a place where the hell, the the place that we now know as hell is actually sent. You could turn there with me, Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. I appreciate your patience. I won't be yelling this whole time, but I want you to know how serious I am. Look, then death and Hades, or death and hell, were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Look at this, what it says. Anyone's name who was not written in the book of life was thrown where? Into the lake of fire. So you can look at it like this, those of you who are experienced with the penal system. Hell is the county jail where convicted criminals go until their court date, and if they're sentenced to a strong enough sentence, they'll then go to penitentiary to serve out their sentence. Right now, hell is the temporary place where the departed go waiting for the judgment. When the judgment comes, when Christ has come back, all that are in hell will be sent into the lake of fire. In that lake of fire is eternal fire, hence the name, brimstone, a place of torture and everlasting destruction. Things that we clearly see in hell is this. You'll always be alone. There is nobody else there with you. You will not have a reputation, a name, or even someone to help you. You're by yourself. Another thing that we see is that God is not there. So whatever God has imparted to you now, whether you are grateful for it or not, or whether you recognize it or not, it is not there with you. Sanity is not there with you. Joy, peace is not there with you. And so we see, my friends, this is what Jesus talked about. Now, I don't have time to debate this. But I've done some videos and other more in-depth subjects because people have tried to say over the years, well, maybe Jesus was talking metaphorically. Maybe hell just meant hell on earth. Maybe the fire just meant a bad life. Maybe the gnashing of teeth just means sometimes you get upset. Maybe the worms mean the memories that don't fade. And they try to say that basically hell is here. These are the problems we all face. But then one day we all go to heaven. Let me tell you something that is not supported by Scripture, and it is a lie. And I'm going to give you some quotes from other wise men, but I'm just here to tell you, that's a lie. Read the Bible yourself and see whether or not Jesus was speaking metaphorically about hell when he talked about it even more than heaven. As a matter of fact, those of you who remember the Kingdom of God series, we talked about just the, the minimal descriptions that Jesus gives about heaven. But my friends, is it not terrifying the multiple descriptions he gives of hell? You can only fill a half a sheet of paper with the descriptions of heaven. But look it up just online, descriptions of hell, verse after verse after verse. Jesus repeating himself, saying the same thing in different ways. Why? Because he wants us to have it in our mind. There is a time of judgment, it is eternal, and there is a place where evil men go. Because in our minds we can get a caricature 
of hell, like I said, of a cartoon, which seems silly, or we can start to get another understanding that's false, that it's not rational, that somehow it couldn't be really that bad, that really if God was going to punish us, maybe it would end at some time. Maybe there would be this thing called annihilation, like how the Jehovah Witnesses believe, that at some point it finally ends, or, or maybe there's a, another chance at life, like reincarnation. But you see, not only is it biblical to believe in hell, but of course it's fully rational because all rationality comes from God because he is the truth. The very first basis of rationality comes from a mind, and Christ has the mind. He is the all-powerful mind that has created us. And from his mind comes reason. When he speaks truth, all truth finds its basis in him. He speaks what is of himself in his nature. That is why the Bible says God cannot lie, because lying would be a contradiction not only of what he says, but who he is. God is not just holding the truth as an object. Jesus says, I am the truth. He doesn't just hold life like a gift in his hand. He is the essence of life. That's why he breathed into us and gave us the essence of our spirit and who he is. And he is just not holding light like a light bulb. He is light. He's not a color of black, white, and yellow, Hispanic, Latino, Anglo, uh, African American. He is the color of glory. He shines with the brightness of the Father. Now, I want you to understand these quotes in the context of what we just talked about. Here's C.S. Lewis being honest. There is no doctrine which I more willingly re- would want to remove from Christianity than this if it lay in my power. So he says, I wish that there wasn't a hell. But it has the full support of Scripture, especially of our Lord's own words, and it has been held by Christendom and has the support of reason. He went on to say this, In the long run, to all who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. So someone here says, well, I don't feel comfortable with hell. C.S. Lewis said, well, it really comes down to this question then. What are you asking God to do? What should God do with evil then? To wipe out their past sins at all costs, to give people a fresh start, smoothing over every difficulty and offering miraculous help? Is that what you wish God would do? Is just rid the world of evil, take away all the problems? That's what he did on the cross. That's exactly what he did. But you don't want it. There is no other answer. To be forgiven, you can't be forgiven. To leave them alone, to leave those alone, what do you want God to do if you reject the cross? Listen to what he says, to leave them alone. Alas, I'm afraid that is what he does. Hell is God's way of saying, you had a life, you had a choice, now I leave you alone. That's what you wanted. Look at what else C.S. Lewis said. I have met no people who fully disbelieved in hell and also had a life-giving belief in heaven. And I found that to be true as well. You talk to people who don't believe in hell, but yet they believe in heaven. It's not a real heaven. It's a make-believe heaven. It's an heaven almighty or whatever that show was. It's a fake heaven. It's a heaven that's goofy and silly and not motivating. But you talk to the Christians who are willing to be beheaded on the shores of Syria. You see, my friend, they believe in a heaven because they're willing to die for Christ. And they also believe in a hell for those who reject him. That's why they don't buckle under the pains of death. You see, those of you here today who think you understand Jesus, you understand God, but you don't believe in hell, you don't know the first thing about God. You haven't understood his teachings. C.S. Lewis goes on to say the damned are, in one sense, successful. Rebels to the end. The doors of hell are locked on the inside. They enjoy forever the horrible freedom they've demanded. And they are therefore self-enslaved. You choose another religion over Christ, you're self-enslaved. You did that to yourself. You choose the love of this world over Christ. You did this to yourself. You allow the pains of this world to get you to think God is the devil and the devil is your God, and so you serve him. You are self-enslaved. Look what else C.S. Lewis said. To enter heaven is to become more human than you ever succeeded in being on earth. To enter hell is to be banished from humanity. Some people want to be humanists, and now it's popular to be a secular humanist, and yet they think they can truly be human without the creator of humankind, Christ Jesus. 
Those who try to be human without Christ are acting as mere devils and imitating Satan in his rebellion. To truly be human, to truly care for your fellow brother or sister, to truly love yourself because you can't love your neighbor until you love yourself because you have to give them that same love. To truly love yourself is to love Christ who made you, to bow your knees, submit to him, and say it's your way, not my way. Otherwise, you'll be banished. You didn't create yourself, and you don't get to choose where, you, where your soul goes after your body dies. That's the rebellion of man. You want to impose yourself on God. You want to say, God, well, you created me. Now deal with me. Deal with my attitude. And if you don't deal with my attitude, you're not loving. My friends, you wouldn't know love unless there was a God. You would be lost and confused and insanity. And you know what the sad thing is? is those who deal with mental illness the most, those who deal with sickness the most, those who have gone through history with the most pain happening to their life are generally the most easiest to convince and share a loving God with. Why? Because they know they can't trust their own flesh. They can't trust this world. You see, it's those of us here who take that slow, gradual road to hell that are hard to convince to get off of it because you just don't believe it's leading to destruction. You're convinced that this road will not turn out the way Christ said it would. My friends, you will deceive yourself in the end. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, those who don't abide in me, they get cast off and thrown into the fire. Here's a beautiful woman's quote about hell to help you understand it better. She said, there seems to be some kind of a controversy or a conspiracy to forget or to conceal where the doctrine of hell comes from. You know, who came up with this idea of hell anyway? The doctrine of hell is not a medieval priestcraft, something from the dark ages, Dante's Inferno type stuff for frightening people into giving money to the church. It is Christ's deliberate judgment on sin. We cannot repudiate hell without altogether repudiating Christ. You want to take Jesus serious, you better take hell serious. You say, well, I don't take hell that serious. You don't take Jesus serious then. And I want everyone to look up at me, please. I don't say this to boast. I say this for your own help. Let the truth be told. There is a hell. Amen. And there are people going there. And that's why I preach. And that's why I go street witnessing. And that's not only just for the cowardly pastors. I have a problem with the money-grubbing pastors that have the church so consumed with their best life now that they don't understand there's a hell. Yes, I have my best life now, friends, and yes, I love Jesus, but there is a hell that the majority of this world is going to. I don't have time to keep tickling your ears with the same old Sunday school stories. I need to raise up an army of disciples who will plunder hell and populate heaven and who will do what Charles Spurgeon said, if Chicago wants to go to hell, if Wright College wants to go to hell, let them walk past me preaching there every Monday. If the Belmont and Clark community wants to go to hell like Sodom and Gomorrah, let them go past our preachers. And we're not screaming at them. We're not angry with them. We're just here telling them, my friends, there's a hell. And if you think there's not a hell, then there is no Christ, and you've been deceived about him. There are only two kinds of people in the end, C.S. Lewis said. Think of it this way. Those who say to God, thy will be done, or to those whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Let that sink in. God, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, it's my life. It's, I mean, it's your life. My body is now yours. My mind is yours. Mine is yours. Right? That's what it means to live for Jesus. My sexuality is yours. My family is yours. My money is yours. And then there's other people. This is mine. It's my body. I'll do with it what I want. This is my money. I'll do with it what I want. This is my life. I'll do with it what I want. And the last one, just something to think about from John Piper. If the evils Jesus died for aren't significant enough to warrant eternal punishment, then the grace displayed on the cross isn't significant enough to warrant eternal praise. See, this is a problem even good people have an issue with is eternal punishment. 
Sometimes people get in this idea of, yes, maybe sinners deserve to be punished. Yes, maybe even if a Christian backslides or turns away from God, they deserve to be punished. But, Pastor, why must it be for eternity? They only lived for a few years. They only were 80 years old. And let's say even like Hitler, they did the worst things possible. Why should they be tortured for millions and millions and millions and millions and years without end? It's unfair. Because what they don't understand is that they're rejecting an eternal God who sent his eternal son to purchase for us an eternal glory. You substitute the eternal glory for God, uh, the eternal glory of God on the cross. You only have left eternal damnation. You're playing with eternity, in other words. Eternity is at stake. Jesus is not just a good man. He is not coming like Braveheart to die for a good cause. He is not coming just to make bad people good. He is God in the flesh dying that dead people might live. He is coming to purchase a kingdom for his father. When you celebrate Christmas, and those of you who do, you need to remember it's not about a baby. It's about a king who became a baby to die on the cross for the sins of those who committed treason against him who took the side of his enemy, the devil. And so John Piper brings to mind this this point of eternity. And my friends, may we understand what we're trading if we trade Christ now. And so in closing, what I want you to see here is what Peter said. How many think Peter knew something about Jesus? How many think Peter heard some of the words of Jesus and probably took him serious? You can turn there with me or just quickly look up here as, as uh, Vinny comes to the keyboard. And thank you for your patience today. I know it was tough in some ways, but I pray it's benefited your soul. Just like good discipline is good for the soul, uh, good for the body, I pray this was good for the soul. I have to have serious talks, amen? And if I didn't take hell serious, would you respect me as your pastor? What if everything was a joke to me? You can't take me serious. Look what Peter said. Look at, just hear the words of Peter. Imagine, sometimes we forget where this Bible came from. It it was letters. They didn't have email. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have text. They wrote letters. And they didn't get to see each other a lot. They were being persecuted. They were underground. The Roman Empire was against them. I want to encourage you in a world gone crazy. Christianity was birthed out of a world gone crazy. It was birth in a world where homosexuality was rampant to the point where they had sex with children. Pederasty was popular. The soldiers would bring young boys with them to battle to pleasure them. Lesbianism. They even had temples for their false gods where they would come and have sex with prostitutes as a form of worship. Pagan idolatry, literally at the height of its pinnacle. Jesus was crucified barbarianism. I mean, crucified. Think about what that is. You're pinning some up to a tree with with nails, whipping them. Let us not be afraid of this world. This is where our Christianity was birthed. It's how we came in, and it's how we'll go out. We came in in a world gone crazy. We'll go out in a world gone crazy. But listen to Peter. He says, if they talking about Christians, just right up before, I mean, sometimes I wish I could quote the entire book before I preach the passage, but just for sake of time, he says, if they, Christians, escape the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. If you, Metro Praise International, those of you engrafted in who have escaped the world, you haven't loved it, you know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you know him, he is your Lord and Savior. If you or I are entangled in it again, like a spider's web, trapped by the world's desires and lies that we believe in our heart and are overcome and Jesus' words become unfruitful, we're now worse off at the end than we were at the beginning. 
Verse 21, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed down to them. Now, I want you to hear this. This is Peter talking. He's quoting from the Old Testament. Now, these quotations come from the book of Proverbs. Listen to what he says. Listen to the image. Come on, get this in your mind, people. Listen to the image he puts here into your mind. He says, of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit. A dog returns to its vomit. And a pig that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. He paints a picture of disgust. He said, you were a Christian. You were washed clean. You were brought into the presence of God. The Holy Spirit dwelt within you. You could hear the voice of your father speaking through Jesus. You had the assurance of better things to come. You had the word of God made alive to you. You literally tasted the glory of God. You could see that he was good. His praise was on your mouth. Your heart was at peace with him. And yet, you turned like a dog going to vomit. A pig going to the mud. God have mercy on us all if we ever believe something other than this. That's what it looks like. I'm only 38 years old and I've seen people come in and out of this church and so often it's obvious. Oh, they're in sin. Look, now they're getting a divorce. Oh, it's obvious. Oh, they're back on drugs. Oh, it's obvious they've lost their job. But that, that's not the ones that concern me. The ones that concern me is when they stop serving God, things kind of look up in life. Oh, I see they got a new house. Oh, they they got married out in Cancun. Oh, they've lost some weight. Look at them. Life's so good. You know why? Because it adds a temptation to me. Maybe, maybe, maybe God's not so strict. Maybe I should loosen up as a pastor. Maybe I should loosen up a little bit. Not everybody's that bad. I mean, they're not selling drugs or anything. I mean, it worked out okay. Their, their kids are happy. They got a nice, nice job. Maybe, maybe I've been praying too much. David talked like this in one of the Psalms. If you want it, Facebook it to me. Maybe, maybe I've been pushing too hard at this thing. Maybe I should have been eased up a little bit. Maybe, maybe God is not that good that you need to abide with him. But you see, when that temptation comes to my heart as a pastor, when I see the prosperity of the wicked, when I see their prosperity, I, I'm reminded of this scripture. It's just vomit. It's just mud. They're just playing in the dirt. They, th- they think that job is going to satisfy their soul. Turn down the keys a little bit. I need to preach this so everybody can hear me. Thank you. It's just vomit. It- it's just vomit. That degree they have on their wall is just vomit. Because in the end, it doesn't last. In the end, there is no doctors. In the end, there are no CEOs. In the end, there are no rich. In the end, there are no beautiful. There are only dogs and pigs and those left outside of the gates. Read Revelation 21. i got to read it to you. Revelation 21 talks about what it looks like when the dwelling of God comes with men. Look at it. It's all here. But he says, but the cowardly, but the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters, the liars, 
They'll be consumed to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. You continue on, oh, there's gates. There's the gates of the city, the new Jerusalem. There's the temple of God and his people. The lamb is there. There's no more sun. The glory of God shines through the sun of God. So we need no S-U-N sun. The S-O-N sun is the glory of all the nations. Oh, but there's nothing impure will ever enter it nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh, and now you keep reading in the Revelation chapter 22. There's no more tears. There's no more curse. You'll see God face to face. There'll never be another night again. Oh, but those who are vile, they can't come in. Those who don't do right can't come in, but there's rewards, there's ropes. I mean, listen to this. And you want to know something? The red letter is Jesus. That's why you know in the just a old school Bible, red letter is Jesus. Jesus comes in at the end of Revelation. He starts talking. Here's what he said. Outside are the dogs. You mean if my grandma doesn't know Jesus, she's a dog and Eternity, that's what she's like. Yes, outside are the dogs. Jesus talked like that. Jesus. Is he going to feel sorry for those dogs? Or is he going to, no, no. Outside are the dogs. Those who practice magical arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root. He's not only the vine, but he's the root that the vine comes from. The offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And then the Holy Spirit gets excited and starts talking. And the Spirit and the bride says, come. Come. Let the one who hears say, come. Can I smile now at you? Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life come. That's what Jesus is talking about in this passage. In abide. He's not focusing on the fire. He's focusing on the freedom of friendship. You might say to me, Pastor, are you running to heaven because you're afraid of hell? No, I'm running to heaven because Jesus is there and hell has nothing for me. Just imagine if I was driving east towards the city. You could say, Pastor, are you afraid of Naperville? Is that why you're running towards the city, driving towards the city? No, I'm not afraid of Naperville. I just want to go downtown. Joe, jo, are you living for Jesus and on the path of righteousness because you're afraid of hell? I'm not afraid of hell. I'm just madly in love with Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the bright and morning star, the great I am, the shepherd of my soul. Hallelujah. I'm in love with Jesus. He's captured my heart. He came and died on a cross for my sins. He forgave me when I couldn't even forgive myself. He loved me when I couldn't even love myself. That's why that last part of this passage of abide is so important. Jesus says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. This this is like a, a husband talking to their wife. Honey, I am loving you with everything I have. Stay with me. Stay with my love. Don't cheat on me. Don't leave me. Listen to Jesus. I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Stay here, child. Stay here, son. Stay here, daughter. Don't go out there. I love you. I love you. Abide here. Stay here. Stay here a while and don't leave. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Those commandments are so obvious. That's why this church is growing. That's why God is doing great things even though we talk about hell. Because when you see the commandments as the Bible teaches them, they're, they're a light unto your path. They're, they're joy to your soul. Not lying doesn't hinder your life. It blesses you on the inside. So forth and so on for all the commands. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And so here's the closing, because it's not about hell, it's about heaven. And it's, it's not about the devil, it's about Jesus. And it's not about being angry, it's about being loving. Think of it this way. You might say, Pastor, are you afraid you're ever going to backslide and go to hell? No. Not at all. I have about as much fear of backsliding and going to hell as I do of dying on Mars because of lack of oxygen. I'm not going to Mars. Mars has nothing for me. I'll never step a foot there. I have no fear of it at all. Hello. I have no fear of hell because the Father loved the Son and the Son loved me. And he made it real simple for me. He said, you want to stay a while in my love? Yeah, Jesus, I do. Well, then you will never, never suffer punishment. You will never be cast out because I want you to stay. Pastor, what if we sin? Well, go listen to last week's message. That's why I talked about that one first. He'll prune us, not cut us off, not throw us into the fire. He prunes us. He snips out gently, but yet precisely those things that don't belong. He's doing that in our lives. For what purpose? To bear more fruit. And so I want to be pruned, not cut off. Let's abide in Jesus. And do I have permission to come talk to you privately if I see you turning away? Can your brother or sister do that? Are we our brother's keeper? Do we love each other enough to take each other side by side, hand by hand, and say, let's go to heaven. Let's abide in Christ. Let's enjoy the journey with Jesus. Let's get as many out there from the world as we can. Let's show the gay community there's a better way. Let's show the corrupt politicians there's a better way. Let's show the Donald Trumps of this world that it's better to be poor and rich in faith than to be rich and poor in faith. Amen? I want to see America changed. I want to see President Obama come before the State of the Union with tears coming down his eyes and call us to a day of repentance like George Washington did and say we've sinned and we've gone astray. We have enemies at our door. We need to pray for the mercy of God. I want to see your friends and family fill up these altars and accept Christ. Next week we're going to be doing the talent show unto the Lord, you know, a tribute to the king. I'll be preaching a message with a smile on my face because the Bible says it's the love and kindness of God that brings men to repentance. I'm not threatening them with hell. I'm just wanting God's children to know the seriousness of hell. Hello? But bring your friends. Bring your family. Let our children fill the stage with their Sunday school songs. And let us all be reminded this is why he came. He's the reason for the season. This is why we celebrate. This is why we give gifts one to another. Is because Christ gave the greatest gift to us. And I would like to see this time next week as I close out that service that there are souls coming to the King. Your mom, your dad. You know one time we had an Easter service and Cynthia Rodon's mom came to the Lord. She was an older woman. And you know what? Just a few weeks later she died. She's in heaven. Hallelujah. She's abiding with her Savior. She's there. Let's get our friends and family there. Amen. Can you stand up with me and give Jesus a hand clap of praise? Amen. Amen. The one and only Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who died for our sins.